friends sitting here in the audience. We're up here at the table to get you guys a jump start on editing and self-editing your books to a higher quality standard and, and doing it quickly. <laughs> By now you all know that it helps to have clear, concise, and hopefully engaging content for your readers since that's what drives your sales. Am I flipping? Yes, you are. Tell me we There we go. Right. How many people in here are editors? <laughs> All right. Well, How does many that count editing your own? Or professional? Oh, professional. professional editor. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are self-editing? <laughs> All right, good. I we like that show for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have goodies for you today? <laughs> All right, moving on to the next slide. What is clarity? Um, guys, if we can kind of keep the chatter down, the, the audio is not great, so anything you guys say is getting picked up by that as well. Thank right. you. Moving on as we move into clarity, we have Jackie Scherer, who is one of our newer editors with LMBPN. She has jumped on board and is doing a fantastic job getting up to our standards. She did it in a matter of eight books, folks. Yes. Wow. She's one of the fastest people we have onboarded since the company started. Yes. <laughs> Lynn Stigler, over to my right, is the former head of the editing consortium. She handed off the reins to me, which is why you get me talking more today <laughs> instead of her from last year. <laughs> I'm still Michael Anderley, Craig Martell's personal editor, so yes. I, get, I get to be a uh, uh, I get to inflict all of this on them, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when they don't get it from her, they get it from me. I'm Tracy Burns, head of Skyfire Editing, which is the head of the editing team for LMBPN at this point. It is quite a challenging role since we are publishing anywhere from 27 to 40 books per month. It was kind of funny because we published uh, for when we need a new editor because we lost uh, one of our uh, members, one of our editors this uh, in April, and um, we published that we needed a new member of our editing family. And so many people came back to us. They weren't applying to the job. They said, "Oh, you can't do what you do," and we're like, ah, "Watch us." <laughs> so, and we are one of the I mean the industry standard for yes. how indies published so it, it was I think very tempting to throw down in that thread and yeah. say 20 books editing challenge face to face yes <laughs> <laughs> that's right I refrained for I'll now. give you one of ours from our ghost right one of our ghost writers that just provides endless fodder yes yes 80,000 okay. at 80,000 words suddenly becomes 55,000 yes <laughs> okay. which is a nice segue into clarity why do you want it? Why does it matter to readers? Well, you want them to get through your book, right? Page counts rack up, you earn money, sales of ebooks and paperbacks, possibly audiobooks, all revenue streams. If the readers are putting your stuff down, you don't get paid for it. Compelling storytelling. You can have a fantastic story. If it's buried in unnecessary language, it's really hard to get to and keep readers engaged. You want readers to comprehend what you're writing easily. You want them to enjoy it. You don't want them in a slog. You want to maintain your story's pace. If you're bogging it down with unnecessary language, readers are going to feel it and react accordingly. Next slide. I'm sure all of it sounds familiar. Maybe a few of you are feeling called out. I'm calling myself out on that. I write as well as edit, and I am a wordy little son of a gun in my first draft. I got to deaf edit Tracy. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Back when she was doing fans right, that's how she came with us. She not only got to edit me, she got the first professional story I'd ever written. So yeah, double whammy there. <laughs> Next. Next up, what gets in the way of clarity? Overusing words, phrases, or actions. 
if your character is barking out a laugh 85 times in your story, <laughs> that's overuse. Mm -hmm. It is also over phrasing. They laughed, they chuckled, they giggled, they snorted, they snickered. They don't give a nod, they nod. <laughs> yes. Long or complex sentences. If you are writing sentences that are anywhere from 30 on up words per, your readers are going to start going, okay, where's the end of this thing? Shorter and snappier is easier to read. It also moves your story along. If you have complex concepts, break them down. I had an author recently that had a hundred plus word sentence. Oh. I broke it into four thinking that was still a lot of words in the sentence. When I gave it back to him, he put it back. Oh. His JIT people called him out on it and said, are you kidding me? We can't understand this sentence and if it's going to audio, we can't go back and look at what you meant. Right. And so many books do go to audio now. Yes, they do. We edit as if all of our books are going to audio. Did you have a question? Yes. I've read before that you should have a combination of short and long sentences for variety. Oh, sure. Yeah. Are you yes. saying that that's not best practice? <laughs> no, it is. But long doesn't mean 100 words. Long means 25 instead of 5. Gotcha. And you can also just vary the sentence structure itself. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Long paragraphs. A little less problematical in audio because your narrator is going to be using the punctuation you give them, but in an ebook or a print book, uh, you don't want to read a wall of text. It's not a fun experience because you're sitting there going, when do I get a break? When do I get a break? Also, don't have two characters speak in one paragraph. Yes. Break them. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many people do not do that. Wordiness. Yes. We said that. <laughs> yeah. 10 or 20 words when two or three will do. Please don't. <laughs> Your editors and readers will love you if you don't. Consistently missing words or using incorrect words. Can I speak one to that wordiness? I see sentences yeah. like, like um, it appeared to be some kind of blah. <laughs> What does that add to your story? <laughs> what? Doesn't it balance it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to get you more KU, but not when they don't read the second term. Yes. If you're missing words, a lot of times your mind will read over it. But if you are missing critical words, your reader loses comprehension. They have no idea what you're trying to tell them. And now they're sitting there jarred out of the story trying to figure out what the heck you meant. So that's something to be aware of. Could yes. Give, I, could you give an example of that one? We have a slide coming up in a oh. little bit with an example. It's Great. a simpler one, but it'll illustrate the point. Incorrect word choices. We'll speak a little more on that later. Uh, homonyms and homophones are big ones for that. Also misusing a word, you know what you meant, your reader might not, and it produces some often hilarious results at your expense. <laughs> yes. Punctuation. This is another big one that we look at. Some writers use too much of it. Commas. You're going to hear us hammer that. There is a time and place for them. Overusing them is not verb is not good. And just because all your grammar lessons in school said you need them, unless you need a pause, don't use a comma. My brother, comma, David, comma. When you say just my brother David, you don't have a pause in there, do you? Yeah. Think how you speak you naturally. Your punctuation yeah. reflects how you would talk to someone and the pauses you put when you're speaking. Our motto is we don't need no thinking comments. Would that be in dialogue or throughout the story? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to both. Yeah. 
Are you for or opposed to the Oxford? You will see that in the right slides later on as well. Oxford commas are not your enemy, they are your friend. They <laughs> avoid so much misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you if you choose not to use an Oxford comma, you end up with the strippers JFK and Stalin. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. 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 Other punctuation errors. We'll go over those in a little bit as well. Know which spellings of certain words are correct for your target audience. Here in the U.S., we use toward. Over in the U.K., it's towards. Understand your pr your primary audience right in their language. If you're a British author and you're writing for Americans, sorry to tell you, you got to use tour. And also, I was sat at the table is a British construction. That'll throw your American readers if you're British. <coughs> yes. And that's opposed to I was sitting at the table. Also, if you use articulated lorries instead of semi trucks, you might lose. <laughs> <laughs> Some southern dialects use tours. The whole family from the oh, hills, the Appalachian Mountains, they use tours. And guess what? They have the closest to the colonist speech when they came over here, is yeah. what they say in the Appalachians. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, next. Next. All right, so now we've covered a few mistakes. How do I figure out which mistakes I'm looking for, and how the heck do I clean them up? By the way, this goes double, all of what we said in the previous slide goes double for those of you who dictate, because it's, you need to make time to go back and look at your books that you do. Yes, dictation is notorious for introducing errors Especially and missing books. words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can usually tell within <coughs> five pages of a manuscript who dictated from the start and who was typing. Mm -hmm. Moving next. Start by identifying overused words and phrases. Uh, some ways that you might be able to do this, beta readers, proofreaders, arc readers, mention it to you, casually or not so much. Do you think you, you might overuse blah a little bit? You really love to say really. <laughs> Does anyone in your family speak like that? <coughs> Why are the aliens saying, I mean, before every sentence? <laughs> right? so you, you'll want to check your manuscript, your blog post, your marketing copy, whatever writing you are working on for phrases that creep in without you realizing you're doing it. And they are sneaky. They will creep in. Are you going to mention Smart Edit? Yep. We're okay. moving to the next slide. Okay. Another way that you can identify words and phrases that are commonly overused, get an extensive list from a fellow 20 booker, your author network, or an editor. See the three of us. We got you covered. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get the website for that at the yes. end. Another helpful way of learning to pare down your writing for less wordy, etc., is to obtain a copy of Strunk and White's The Elements of Style. We prefer the third edition, not the fourth. The third edition is much better written and sticks to their concepts better than the fourth edition does. It was written in 1979, but it still applies. Yes. What was it called? Strunk and White. The Elements of Style. Yes. We got you covered on that one, too. Right. Now that you got your list, you got your elements of style, now what? I hear you reading the content yet again. Your eyes are glazing over. Some pro tips to help deal with that. Take at least five days off before <coughs> starting your work after you finish writing it. <coughs> this is going to give your brain a chance to reset enough that you're seeing it with fresher eyes. You will be more apt to pick up the mistakes, less apt to read over the things that should be in there and aren't. Another trick is to read your manuscript or blog post, etc., backwards. You'll pick up a lot of stuff that way. Having it read aloud, whether it's via words, read aloud feature, or another one, is also another handy yeah. trick. 
Some people can't use it, but for those who can, I recommend it. Make sure this is part of your process and budget the time to do it. It will take longer than you think. Once you start getting into the weeds of cleaning up all the stuff that you're going to get on your list of overused words, phrases, etc., you're going to sit there for at least several hours running globals going, I can't believe I used 192 instances of just. Mm -hmm. No lie, I have a manuscript recently came in that that was how many instances and it was not part of another word. Moving to the next. If you're not already familiar with them, Word is known for this as a feature. LibreOffice, OpenOffice have it as well. Some other programs, I believe Scrivener has a search function as well. Meet the search bar and its famous kissing cousin, the advanced find box. They are your best friends for locating all the bugaboos and going through them one fell shot. So instead of spending three days reading your manuscript trying to find 150 different variations of things you want to weed out, run it as a global, do one at a time, come down through, once you've done that, move to the next on your list. It will save you countless hours. This is a trick that we use every day in our edits. You also see, when, they're, when you see them like all at once like that, it really makes you see how many times you've used it. Yes. It will highlight it on your page in yellow as you're sitting there and looking at a sea of it going, oh. <laughs> Smart edit is another handy tool when you're going through this stage. Our former editor, Judah, the family member we lost, was a wizard with Smart Edit. She loved it. She got fantastic results using it. The she rest of us don't do so well with it, but it's yeah. a lovely thing. But it, what, it will give you the 196 instances of just, it will tell you the words you overuse, et cetera, and give you a report on the manuscript. Yes. Huh. Is that through Microsoft Word? No, it's a, a program called oh, Smart Edit. I'm not sure if they have a free version. But I would have to look into that. Yeah. I don't use it myself. We had a lot of Grammarly does, and we'll mention that too. <laughs> okay. Uh, that it's black and gold. The one before that. Where it starts with search. Yep, that one. Okay. The search bar is the one that is going to allow you to locate a word or phrase within your document. It's handy when you want to reference something. What did I call that character back in chapter three? Or what was that company name in chapter 110? It also is the one that will pull up how many instances of a word or phrase you've used. Yes. Advanced find, aka find and replace, is the one that will let you go in and do replace all or find and replace next if you're being selective because there are times where you have the word and you need it spelled with capital for one thing, but you might need it lowercase for something else. Yes. So rather than doing a, oh, I'm just going to select all and hit it, and now all of a sudden you have sentences that aren't starting with capitals. Let me actually address that, because the way that I do that, if I have something, I do a lot of military science fiction, the general, we don't capitalize general, but a lot of people do. The only one is one of Michael's characters. Um, but anyway, so what I'll do is H-E space capital general, and then I'll replace it with H-E space lowercase general, and then I don't have to deal with the beginning of my sentences. Correct. If I might, um, what I'll frequently do is I'll do the find and replace global, uh -huh. then I'll do period space capital to fix the ones that need capitalization, say with question mark, exclamation point, mm -hmm. in case they're yeah. made better. Yeah, yeah. I, you can do that too. It's yeah. just the, I'm just mentioning the one that works for me. Yeah. There, there, there are there various are ways to do it, so it's, it's a matter of finding which one you are comfortable with and get consistently correct results. Yeah. One of the things we didn't mention here is how we edit. Just as a, a, a quick, and this is how I personally edit, I go through with Mark One Eyeball with Grammarly running at the side. And Grammarly, as those of you who've used it will know, is not always right, but boy, it is, when it does, it comes in handy because you can just flip through things. 
Then I go backwards through whatever's left after I hit the bottom because it lets you see it, as Tracy said, in a different way. After that, I do perfect it, which will help you with consistency and missing punctuation. And after that, I do um, this word, not only spelling, but also the grammar because surprisingly, grammar picks up things that spelling does not. So we do at least four passes on every edit that we do. Yes. And it is all integrated and it is very much that process. The only thing that I do differently from Lynn is I tend to run perfect it last because every now and then something in the spell check or grammar check from words wizard will come up and screw something up on me and perfect it will help me catch it. Now see I'm a perfect it first girl because that way they don't distract me. That way that they're out of the way before I start reading it. So yep. yeah. But that's in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So grammarly mark on the eyeball perfected? <laughs> mark on eyeball is doing it, just reading. Visually. It. Visually. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> do any of you use for writing? Me? No. I have tried it. I do not like it as well as Grammarly. Both of them have their faults. Uh, they often disagree with one another on the same issue. <laughs> yeah, and I, I tried it and just went, yeah, no. What was the question? Whether we use pro writing aid. Okay. okay, we don't. But that doesn't mean it isn't a good product. It just means it, yeah. it's so subjective what works for a certain person. Right. I know so. people who do better with pro writing aid and prefer it. I'm not going to argue if you're getting results with it. I, I am all about whatever is getting you your best work yes. before it comes to a professional editor. Yes. And for those of us in the audience who are professional editors, authors, we really love it, really, really love it when we see you taking the time to improve your writing craft. Yes. Yes. Because not only does it make our job easier, it makes your stories that Better. And your editing will be cheaper too. Yeah. Yes. There is that, and it's a not inconsiderable consideration. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving to the next. This is the example that has 105 instances of just in this particular manuscript, or a different example. <coughs> yeah. So. Yeah. It's just a screenshot of yeah, seeing it in action. Okay, and the last on the pro tips, we do not like to see overuse of and, but, and so to begin sentences. I understand it's a mechanism. There are times where if you write it in dialogue especially, it'll leave it alone because the sentence isn't going to work as well without it. It'll change the meaning to delete. But if you come at me with 132 instances or more per document, expect to see red button. Yeah. But in the end are two of the globals that we do, and you'll see that yes. in our list. And we're also back to the I mean, yes. especially with the aliens. It seems to be the phrase du jour. For a while it was not so prevalent. I would say in the last three months, um, very nearly every manuscript we've had in, every character is using it at some point. I mean or so, what does this add? One character can speak idiosyncratically, but everybody? Yes. Moving right along. There we go. <laughs> Longer complex. There we go. It's my 100 word sentence. Yes. This is going back to the earlier point about splitting apart long and or complex sentences, and Lynn's example of the 100 word sentence. Classic case of real life right there where the author's readers went, well, what are you trying to do to us? <laughs> and he still didn't change it down. Yeah. Whatever. <coughs> his book. Yeah. Which means his readers and his listeners are probably going to be sitting there scratching their heads at least a few times. Be that as it may, it is the author's choice, but be aware of that pitfall. <coughs> Moving on to the next about breaking long paragraphs, the wall of text not being a good experience for readers. If you think back to your textbooks in grammar school, high school, college, when you're sitting there going, my eyes are closing and my head's doing this as I'm trying to read, we don't want that. Yeah. 
wordiness. Okay. It is not your friend. So the entire first paragraph is one sentence with multiple clauses. Um, I broke that one down into four different sentences. Uh, thankfully, the author did not get his hands on that, so it got to stay in four sentences. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's our own Rami Vance, and I can twit him about that. So. Yes. <laughs> So, but yeah, it's just, and this entire series was written like that. So we go so far as we end up rewriting. We're extremely careful to, produ to reproduce the author's voice, maintain the author's voice, reproduce if we have to rewrite. But, um, but that's one of the things that we do at LMBPN all the time, is rewrite for people. Yes. So. And all of our authors are aware of it and approve of it. Yes, it's exactly. It's not a case of us going behind their backs. No, they know all. right from the time they come on board and meet with the editing team for the first time, this is part of what we do. But they, some say we want it back, we want to see it, we want to approve it or not, and they, it's their book. They right. get it back, <coughs> and they can do whatever they choose. Yeah. So th is this how people write three or four books a month? They send their first draft off to you guys and you rewrite it? We wish that weren't true, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're focused on getting the books out to the public no. as fast as they can. And God bless Michael, he lets people. Um, and he and I have had discussions about that. <laughs> <laughs> we are actually, as I said, going to be writing, uh, do, running an author's boot camp as well for our newer people. And some of that will be one-on-one -on -one because some of them have very, very unique quirks. But nevertheless, for, for it, it, it's so prevalent what they do uh, as new authors that it, we just like, you know, we can't do this. We have to fix you because yes. this is taking more and more time to edit. Yeah. And to the credit, some of our newer authors have been going through their edits because they chose to do edit acceptance. Yes. And they see what we're changing and they, they get their list of, okay, you're overusing all of this. You're doing this particular sentence construction and it's redundant. And they are making concerted efforts to go in and sharpen and clean up their writing. And yes. I have to say that for at least four of our newer authors on board, they are making huge strides yes. forward. Yes. I went from a book to that I spent probably close to 60 hours editing to a book three that took me about 25. Same author, she stepped up her game and she did it big time. You guys charging by the hour? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for her, no, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Write as badly as you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be advised though, if you send me a manuscript like that, you will be paid by hazard pay rate for work. Yes, we do have a rate we call hazard pay that adds to it. We have some authors that are just playing hazard pay. Yes. I have a question on uh, frequency of editing passes. Uh huh. Um, so people who are looking at sort of the models that are being introduced, like you know, it's writing 15,000 words a day, or writing a book every month, or whatnot, these paces that writers are writing at. Um, when you get done with the book, then you have to go through the editing process. What is like a? I don't know if there's a good number because if bad is bad, then it takes a lot more to edit it and make it good, but. Generally speaking, how many runs, full runs through editing, like the first draft draft, the second one draft, is like an acceptable, realistic number when considering you want to produce something as fast as possible? One. One. If the per author wants edit acceptance, they will go through and they will turn it back to us and whatever they turn into us is what gets published. Correct. So we do our major pass. If the author wants edit acceptance, which most of them at this point don't, they just like, we know what you do, we trust you. And then it just goes straight from us. The little history of LMBPN, in the beginning, we oftentimes um, had got a book on a Monday and we published it on Friday. And that was after it was edited and went through the JIT team. So we were fast, really fast. But we went through this entire process with them and by God, even on those early books, we don't get a lot of typos. We don't get a lot of, you know, anything because we did them following our extremely rigorous. It might take 18 hours in one day, but that's what we did. Yeah. What is JIT team? Uh, JIT team is, uh, is our just-in-time reader team. So it goes, we have a team of beta readers at LMBPN, and they, some of them have preferred genres. Their 
purpose is to bring up story issues. Their purpose is not to edit. So if they have continuity issues in a story, if they say you're losing the thread of this character, this character appeared in scene one and two, they were really interesting, and then you never wrote another word about them, you might want to think about that, etc. That's what they do. Then after we go through all of our various processes and we turn in the edit to our just-in-time team, they go through and catch our last-minute oopsies. Nobody's perfect. So, um, but we try to turn them in with 20 or less typos in the 80K manuscript. So, yeah. and, and if we hit the 20 mark, we feel bad for making them work. <laughs> yes. We have had editors before we really um, uh, regimentalized this that they would turn in books to the JIT team with 400, edit, 400 typos in them. It's like, are you kidding me? What are you doing exactly? All right. Okay, we're we going to pick up the pace a little bit more, moving on to the next example slide. Okay. This is a short one. Lynn, you mentioned this one earlier. An insistence on making sure that they had someone who knew a thing or two. Yeah, they needed someone who knew a thing or two. <laughs> Can be reduced. The other words add nothing, to, in my humble opinion. So. Example three, if we had a little more time, I would have someone up in here in the classroom come up and volunteer to edit this particular segment. <laughs> to give you an idea of what you're looking at, of course, it would have to be the sort of thing that would be able to act as though they had been killed if the signal was tampered with in any way, as well as the sort which wouldn't be tampered with by any of the usual disruptors one tended to run into <laughs> all around the galaxy. There are no commas anywhere within that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of air. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to do the rest between the sentence. Yeah, no. <laughs> this one is just another example. When you see, if you see the presentation um, online, you'll, you'll be able to read these and go, are you kidding me? Yeah. Moving on to a missing word in a context. Um, the slide in this particular one, the first part of it says, how many times did you need to read before you spotted the missing word? There is a missing word in that sentence. I'm willing to bet your mind filled it in and you didn't even realize it. Yes. How many times did you need to read this? Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. do, you, uh, do you suggest uh, a reading app to like sit back and have yeah, like read through what you've just written to catch those on your things. second pass that's a I read things in my head that's uh, so that's how I do it other people have word yes Mark I would just like to mention one particular word that it's easy to miss to, to not realize that you left out that's a really important word and that word is not <laughs> N-O-T <laughs> yeah. yes <laughs> completely <laughs> flips the same. Okay. Missing words, incorrect choices. This is the homophones. Yes. Yeah. Homonyms and homophones are probably some of the biggest mistakes we see for incorrect word choices. This is where dictation tends to bite people. Phased, P-H-A-S-E-D versus phased, F-A-Z-E-D. Two completely different things. Dictation doesn't care. It's going to put in what it wants to put in. Or peaked, peaked, and peaked yeah. interest. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Another big break and break. Yep, break and break. Yes. Moving on to the next. Ground Please versus floor right versus deck. Yes. Folks, if you're outside, you're on the ground. You don't fall to the floor if you're on your front lawn unless you set up a parquet dance floor for some reason, <laughs> in which case I better know about it before you tell me you fell to the floor. If you're inside, chances are likely you're not falling on the ground unless you have a dirt floor house or you're doing some kind of new echo living that I haven't heard about yet. Please inform me if you are. I'm curious, you know, I, I will absorb that as I'm going through your story. If you're on a ship, ship, spaceship, any kind of ship, you're on the deck. It's not a floor, it's not the ground, it's a deck. And upstairs on a ship is above decks or below decks. Yes. And they're ladders, not steps. Yes. So, 
understand your context. There are a couple of exceptions. You might say K4 or forest floor to break things up. We get you, those are acceptable, but be aware. Other phrases that violate that, getting decked, being floored, flooring it, and the classic punishment <laughs> you're grounded. <laughs> okay. We better go through this a little bit faster. Yeah. Yep. We are going to skip ahead to deleting unnecessary qualifiers. Yes, please do this. As soon as she could, paused for a moment, as quickly as possible, stood up or stand up, crouched or ducked or sat down, called out. There are two exceptions. You can stand up or he stood up to bullies, or you feel called out, or someone called you out for a duel if you're writing historical. But otherwise, those really don't add much of anything to your story. Correct. And especially not if you use them every other sentence. Yes. Adjective order. Okay. There is a proper order for adjectives in English. Quantity, opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin or material, qualifier, and your noun. And this is all readily available online as well. Google adjective order in English and you'll pull up umpteen examples of it. If it sounds awkward, you probably got them in the wrong order. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, black long hair? No, long black hair. <laughs> Misbehaving body parts. Folks, with the exception of your autonomous nervous system, your body parts don't move unless you initiate the action. The same holds true for your characters. Her eyes did not rove around the room. They stayed firmly in her head. That's right. <laughs> His hand did not gesture. He made gesture with his hand, but that's the only right. And then we're getting into Lynn's favorite, so I'm going to let her take this one. Present participle phrases. ING words. They <laughs> indicate simultaneous action. One of my favorites is walking across the room, she sank to her knees. I want to watch. <laughs> well, Gretchen Marsh did something like that at one point, but you know, or unless they're doing the limbo, you cannot simultaneously walk to the room, across the room, and sink to your knees. Shutting the door, he walked across the room. No, he didn't. He shut the door. And he walked across the room. We do have a document in here for you to help you know when you're doing things that cannot happen simultaneously. It's a, I call it lazy writing. I think mostly what happens is that people have seen it so often, they think it's okay, and it's not. You're telling somebody they're doing, you're, it's, you're creating impossibility in their situation. Correct. So anything when they don't conflict, that tends to be a really overused construction. Oh, yes, very much so. so. Yeah. Yes. All right, skipping ahead to action in the middle of dialogue. We just covered about five slides in one go. Yeah. There's a whole document on it, don't they, you know? Yes. If you need to interrupt your action or dialogue, with a narrator interjection. Please terminate your dialogue first. So, then go back to speaking. Yeah. In some cases, you might be better off moving your action before or after your dialogue. Not all, but in some. So it's a consideration as you're going through it. Blah, blah, blah. She smiled wryly. Mm, yeah, okay, you know, whatever. Yes, you can leave it in the middle because that's where it belongs, but blah, he shrugged, blah. You generally don't, you can, he shrugged and then you can do your whole string of dialogue. Correct. Don't interrupt it. It's going to sound awful in the audio, honestly. Stop and think of it this way. If I'm having a conversation with someone and the narrator suddenly jumps in to interject in the middle of the conversation, how are you going to react? Kind of a rude interruption. All right. This is where we tell you that after tomorrow's boot camp session and also on Thursday, we are available to meet with you one-on-one -on -one to review a portion of your current work or any work. We won't go through the whole manuscript, but we will sit down and go through and I'd help you identify some of the things, the mistakes that we've just covered that you're making. Um, portions made. What is the word count limit? <laughs> <laughs> a page or two? <laughs> okay, so like yeah. 500 to 1,000? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Recently with a lot of steampunk fantasy and other similar things, I see authors using very esoteric terms, sometimes incredibly archaic terms. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes I have been told I need that for the feel or the flavor. Oh, sure. Do you have the? Uh, okay, so the, your answer absolutely. is I'm sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, if, if it fits in with your book setting and the time period and its terminology that would be used for that genre or the characters, etc., then yes. It's a resource. Yeah. Cool. Next up, resources. Everything we covered in here today, there are about nine different resources we have available for you, including this entire slide deck. Yes. The website URL and there is a QR code. We will go around with computers so everybody has a chance for this. That will get you every material that we promised. Yeah, we have a whole list of weasel words. We have um, the avoiding the P cube trap, homonyms and homophones, including definitions of which is which, and a bunch of other goodies that are all going to be helpful for you as you go through and work on writing cleaner copy. Yes. Our job is, I mean, uh, what we do, our job as editors is to make you, your book the best it can be. And that doesn't mean our opinion. That means allowing your readers to read your story and bring your story forward. Don't, don't let it be lost in the words you may have thought you needed when you started, but if you went back through yourself, probably would cut out if you were aware of them. Correct. So. All right. Okay. And so I'm going to up here if somebody wants to.